I teach exegetically, not expositorially. An expository where we get the word to expound on. You read a scripture and then blah, blah, blah. You exegetically, you take it verse by verse by verse and chapter by chapter and then book by book. And there we go. But today, we're finally going to get to the culmination of what I have been sharing with you for the first five parts of this message. So if this were an ongoing class for weeks, this would be technically like week five. Okay, we're in the book of James. And with your Bibles open, start reading from verse six, which is where we are up till now. With what we have covered, I taught you how to stick it in a teepee. If you're having any issues, you know very well you stick it in a teepee. You stick it in thanksgiving and praise. Up to now, we taught you about wisdom. Wisdom, we talked about knowledge is what you know. Wisdom is what you do with it. Understanding only comes during the passage of time with maturity. We talked about each of these particular parts. I taught you last time about the seven categories of life. And everybody grabbed their cameras and took pictures. And I thought, okay, maybe I better remind you, you might want to do that this time again. And each of the parts that I shared with you, if you have not taken good notes and you don't recall, you could certainly go back through our YouTube channel and you can find them all and you can string them all together and you'll begin to see this possibly is starting to make some sense. But as I sometimes get calls and as sometimes you ponder and wonder on your own, why aren't things working out? Why are you having the frustrations and the struggles you're having? Why are things sometimes always getting to be somebody else's good luck and not yours? And I've been giving you those answers every single time we've been together. So today I'm thrilled we're going to pick it up right here in verse 6. Actually, let's back it up just a hair to verse 5 so we get a running head start. Like pulling the slingshot back, then we're going to let it go. So if any of you lacks wisdom, let Him, right there by then, I taught you how to start writing your name in the book of the Bible so that these become love letters from God to you. So my book says, if Dominic lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And if you wanted to reverse that, you could say, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask, let Dominic ask of God. So you start sticking your name everywhere you can in the Bible so that you begin to make it not only personal. Somebody accidentally trips up on your Bible or steals it. God forbid, imagine that. No, God permit. They would go, wow, this book is written to somebody named Pat. Who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him or her. Or Janice. (laughs) But let Janice ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not Dominic suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Because Dominic is a double-minded man and unstable in all of his ways. You see how you put your name in there? So you let God really talk to you, convict you a little bit? So we're going to talk about this today. Let's pray with me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father, I ask you to bless your word today. Let the teacher come. Move me out of the way. Father, if you'll just speak only through me as a vehicle and a vessel, Lord, just to let your word be heard give you, Father, the passageway into the hearts and the places and the lives of us as your children, so that when we leave here, we will not leave the same way we came in, Father God. Change our minds, change our bodies, change our hearts, as Candace and Mike and the group were singing, that you are the very one who heals our body, heals our mind, heals our spirit, our soul. Bring us, Lord, into these passages as we, as we make every effort, Father God, to open your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Sister Becky opened up with prayer, talking about the promises of God. Interestingly enough, 
I walked into the office and told Papa Mario, he goes, how are you doing? I said, oh, what a rough week. I mean, this week I saw Greenville, South Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia. I got back home. It was a, quite a marathon. This week I'll be running up to, uh, I forget where I'm going this week. Uh, I'm going to Cleveland, Ohio this week. Yeah. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of action going on. And, and all in all, what I'd really rather do is just be here every day with you. So in the midst of all that, then we started singing about promises and a number of things. Okay, they're coming up early, but that's okay. Let's do it now. Pass them out. Go ahead. But just take it and hold it and put it to the side. I brought something to give everybody today, okay? And then I'm going to show you who bought these for you as a gift, okay? So let's get right to the meat of it, okay? Let's go to slide one. I'll yell change as we go. Let's talk a little bit about basically what happens when your life is a failure. Your life is a failure. It's a struggle. It's a grind. You're tripping up simply because your focus is always on your works. You're always more concerned with what you're doing and how you're doing it. You're more involved in who did it and who didn't do it as good as they should have did it for you. You're probably not just a member of the P Club, the 4P Club. You're probably a former president, if not the current president. You're a pretender. You're a performer. You're a persecutor. You're a powder. And everything is always built on works. Who did it good enough and who didn't do it good enough? The next thing you do is you make the object of your faith based on performance. You're grading everything. If it's not an A through F scale, it's a 1 through 10 scale or a 10 through 0 scale. But if the performance isn't adequate, wah, wah, wah. There you go again. we got to call you a wambulance every day. Subsequently, when I talk about your power source, it's just yourself. Your favorite radio station is WIIFM. What's in it for me? The results, I get the phone calls. Pastor Amar gets the phone calls. Brother Mickey gets the phone calls. Brother Simon gets the phone calls. Pastor, pastor, pastor. Now we love it. I love it because then I get an excuse to know at the end of this call, we're going to hear praise the Lord and we're going to pray and rejoice. So we don't mind. Don't think for a moment we mind the grind. Oh, Simon, it's starting. You were up here, weren't you? However, you want to live a victorious life. And a victorious life is going to look like this. Change. You want to live a victorious life? Your focus is on Jesus Christ. Your object of your faith is the cross of Jesus Christ. Because as I taught you before, every blessing we receive comes from Jesus Christ. And the cross is the means that he used for every blessing that you receive. That is why your faith is always in the cross of Jesus Christ as Christ our Lord and Savior who suffered and dies and rose and is coming again provided for us every passageway of victory to live through what he accomplished on the cross. Not beads in a rosary, not statues on a desk, not something you rub in a doorway, not a lucky tie or a lucky pair of socks. It becomes the cross of Jesus Christ, period. The object of my faith is the cross of Christ. That's why Paul says, I am determined among you to preach nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, 17, I did not come to baptize. I came to preach the gospel, not with elegant words of wisdom, lest I make the cross of Jesus Christ of none effect. There is nothing else that has any other effect other than the cross of Christ or you in the flesh. We've already saw how you live a destructive failure life, why you struggle at all. Now the victorious life, the victory because the power source is through the Holy Spirit. The reason that is relative is because when the cross becomes the object of your faith, only then 
only then, only then does the Holy Spirit work within the parameters of the finished work of the cross. The Holy Spirit does not work outside the perimeter of the cross. Is that clear? Do not be hoping the Holy Spirit is going to pick your lucky lottery number. Do not hope the Holy Spirit is going to get you that job. If you did not prepare properly and appropriately to be the most qualified and ready person for it, why are you acting like you're stuck and stupid because you think, oh, now, Holy Spirit, come on, click, click, click. Come on, like my waiter, get me a this, get me a that. Am I making any sense? Praise the Lord. That creates the results of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. It didn't say, oh, victory in my rabbit's foot. In Jesus. Change. So, 2 Corinthians 1.20, what do we see? We see that all of the promises of God in who's him? Jesus, because all of my blessings come from Jesus. That's the him. All of the promises of God in him are yes. And in Jesus, amen. Why in Jesus? Because God the Father does nothing but through Christ. And nothing gets back to God the Father but through Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me, by me, in me. In a previous part, I taught you about the giant ship at the bottom of the ocean. Remember? Had you close your eyes, you remember? Visualizing, and we learned after so much time, the water is in the ship, the ship is in the water, they're inseparable. So all of the promises of God in Jesus are yes, and they are in Jesus, amen. And that is what makes them to the glory of God through us. What parent isn't proud of what their child does right? And what child doesn't feel the pride of what they've done right, except that their parent gives them the acknowledgement of how proud they are? but to God be the glory. So what we know in the Bible is that God makes two types of promises. He makes unconditional promises and he makes conditional promises. Are we clear? Yes, change. So, <clears throat> as an example, an unconditional promise of God, there's approximately 3,700 unconditional promises of God in the Bible. And here's an example of one in Matthew 5, 45 and 46. Read with me. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now, there's just a simple example said that nobody could pick on anything you don't have that somebody else has or something that they don't have that you wish you had. We're talking simply evil, good, rain, Son, simple, so your lousy, stinking, rotten neighbor with the dogs that poop on your yard too much, they're going to get just as much sun and rain as you who just praises God all day long because you're too perfect. Are we clear? Yes. So that's an unconditional promise. It's happening whether you're saved or not. He puts a rainbow in the sky as a reminder so that he's never going to destroy the earth again by a flood because of all those people who deserved the flood. Are we clear? Amen. Say amen. Amen. Okay, so let's take a look at what a conditional promise looks like. And change. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We pretty much know this one by heart, right? We trust in the Lord with all our heart. We don't lean on our own understanding. In all of our ways we acknowledge him. And he shall direct. And in your Bible it should say, and he shall direct Joan's path. He shall direct Mickey's path. He shall direct Desmond's path. He shall direct Simon's 
path. Make it I love you letter from God to you. You have 66 I love you letters. You might start reading them more often when you realize you've got mail. But what would it look like if we saw a conditional promise look a little bit different to us? Everybody together? Change! It would look something like this. These are the conditions that are for us if we're going to be doers of the word and not just complainers, I mean hearers only. I have to trust in the Lord with all my heart. I have to lean not on my own understanding. And in all my ways I have to acknowledge him. And then he shall direct Dominic's path. If you're going to call because of a problem, first just check this one alone. And start your phone conversation with, I have trusted in the Lord with 100% of all my heart. I am not trying to have all the sense. I am giving him all of the credit. What's up with where's the GPS? God plans my steps. Oh, you didn't know that one? I don't know what you use GPS for. And then the pastor will say, oh, he's training your patience. Thank you for calling. Oh. It looks like that. Let's look at another one. Together? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all righteousness. Now let me comment on this for a moment, because some Christians kind of get this one confused. First of all, if is a conditional promise. This is the beauty of how God shows us he's impartial. He has no issue with racism. He has no issue with politicalism. He has no issue with familyisms. He has no issues with socialisms. If you belong to the Lord, you are a child of God. If means anyone. Every one of my kids. From the best to the biggest stinker alive. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to cleanse me. He is faithful to forgive me. When I'm forgiven, I have been pardoned. When I have cleansed, as I am cleansed, I lose my propensity to want to do that again. That's how that's happened over the years that you've been a Christian. You don't hang out with the same kind of people you used to. You don't talk like you used to. You don't go to the places like you used to. You don't respond like you used to. That cleansing is the removal of another layer of that thick onion of yours of ours, that makes us want to go right back in and smell the smelly water again. And that's what changes us. But what it changes us from, especially, is from our unrighteousness. We have 2 Corinthians 5.21, that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we can become the righteousness of Christ he removes the unrighteousness. See where we're going? Good. Let's go ahead. And it would look like this. Now, this is God's side. First, we had four, three things to do, and God did one thing. This time, God's going to do four things for us, and we only had to do one thing. Confess our sin. Fess up. Fess it up. Just take off your wig, pull off your hat, Unloosen your shoes, untie your belt, whatever it takes. Just confess. I messed up. I wanted to, and I did. I knew I shouldn't, and I still did. I messed up. Confess. So if our side, we confess. Notice how that structure you see in the parentheses, the if, so you know it carried over from the other side. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. Wow. 
That's good to know, isn't it? God is faithful. Starting with me at the front of the line, I know a lot of unfaithful people. We're always going to let somebody down. Unfaithful to forgive our sins. And he is just to forgive us our sins. And he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see how this works? Beautiful? Okay. Together? Oh, come on. Together? The thief does not come but to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, but I have come to bring you life, and life more abundant. So what I've done right here in this little image for you is to show you, and for those of you who want to get, I don't want to get into it right now, we get into deep definition of prososis, which is the Greek word where we get our word in the sense of beyond meeting all of our needs. The word abundant means beyond your ability to exhaust, beyond your ability to even let it run low. It would be like you with a big bucket trying to go out and empty the Atlantic Ocean. Just get there and start early. See how silly that is? You get it. What do you mean start early? Yeah, and plan to work a long day. You'll still never make a dent. So from here, okay? Now, it goes beyond meeting all our needs, okay? It's a super abundant in quality. It's super abundant and superior. Look at what we get. By implication, it's excessive. It's beyond any natural ability to exhaust it. Try to drain and... Oh, look at what I just did. I know I've read this before. In the King James Version, exceeding abundantly above, more abundantly advantage exceedingly, very highly, beyond measure, more superfluous, vehement. It just means you won't even be able to notice a dent in, it'd be like somebody leaving you a trust fund with only $17 billion. But don't worry, you have your whole life to spend it. Are you joking? Like the two kids who exaggerated. One kid says, I got millions and millions and millions to your one trillion, so what? It's like the two drunks walking out on the edge of the pier late in the night, and the one they get out there and they get to the edge in the moonlight, and the one drunk says, Wow, would you look at all that water? And the other drunk standing next to him goes, Yeah, that's just the top of it. That's what abundant means. It's beyond just what you can see. It's so deep. It's so deep. That's where you have to become in the passion of your heart in recognizing the deepness. So, open your book to page 24. It's right near the front. Okay? There's 1,133 conditional promises of God in the Bible. As I showed you in context, sometimes there's one thing we do and two or three things God does. Sometimes there's three or four things we do and one thing God does. But in context, that's one conditional promise. And this page 24 on the left, I've given you a clear example, and on the right it describes and explains it, how the running text of this works. Okay? So if you want to dog ear that page, you go right ahead, it's perfectly fine. Did everybody get a copy of the book? Okay? Good. Good. So very quickly, why don't you go ahead and open up to page 71. That'll be a right side page. You'll notice at the top of the page it says life topic number 8. There are 33 life topics in the Bible. Life topics in the Bible that God chose to make his conditional promises out of. 32 of them are available if you are a born-again, spirit-filled, accepted Christ as your Savior person. If you have not answered the marriage proposal, will you marry me to become a Christian, a born-again Christian, then that is the only one single conditional promise you're entitled to. 
Because the intimacy of God, just as he started with Adam and Eve, his first miracle was at a wedding. We're going to have the marriage supper at the, of the Lamb at the end, a big wedding reception. The bottom line is God's big on marriage. And when Jesus told them, depart from me, I never knew you, he was talking pretty intimacy stuff. We've never been completely in the ocean, in the water, remember? Can't distinguish the difference. And that's the only one single conditional promise that they're entitled to. It's get saved. Every single scripture in the Bible for salvation is a conditional promise of God. Not one of them is left out. And the most famous of all, for God so loved the world that he gave his only, be, come on, begotten son, that whosoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Are we clear? No believe you perish and have no everlasting life. If you want to live your life separated from God, then don't complain about why would God cast people into hell. No, you voted to just be now separated from God for the rest of your eternity. And that alone will be enough hell, but there will be more to come. So that's the importance of the distinguishment there. Otherwise, this book, which is not a story, the beginning of it only gives you the theology and the doctrine of why this makes any sense, Romans 4, 19, Abraham did not waver at the promises of God in unbelief. He was strengthened in faith. He gave glory to God. He believed that those things that God had promised, he was able to do, and therefore it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Jesus hung on the cross, and in his final words, he said, it is finished. It what? Good question. The it is this. It's exactly what the cross was for. You want to learn how to live the message of the cross? You want to learn how to work out your salvation in fear and trembling? It's the right column on every page. Because the promise of God, why he went to the cross, is the left column of the page. See? This sits right on top of, with, or alongside, or close nearby, to your Bible all the time, just so you can simply find out wherever you are in your passage of reading. If you go to the last index in the back, it will be the chronological order of the books of the Bible. If you go to the first index before that, it's by topic number. And all of the ones that are in white are in your book, and the ones that are in gray, go fish them out and find them yourself. All 1133 conditional promises of God are in the indexes, but the easiest and simplest 366 of them, once for the leap year, are in the book. Let's take a look on page 71 so you can just see one of them. Look at the last one at the bottom of the page. Now, this goes under category and topic number 35. That's what the little 35 is there for. It's in Proverbs 28, 25. And starting at verse 25, he who... Say he who. That's just like the if. It means no partiality. If I married you, if you married me, even if you're a lousy cook and you don't clean very well, and half the time I don't know where you are, you're still my wife or my husband. Even life topic number nine is for the backslider to get your butt home. He who trusts in the Lord. You see how, that root, see how that runs over? What does it say? Then what's the, what's, the, what's the second conditional promise? Will be prospered. Is that hard? You want to know why you're always struggling? Is your trust in the Lord. Or is it in your visa? Is it in your college degree? Is it in your kids? Is it in your fitness? Is it in whatever you make up? For the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Look at Romans 8.2. 
That's a banner scripture. That's a hold on to this one scripture. Because if you're not free from the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, you're under the law of sin and death, like it or not. Why? Just read the next few more verses. Because everything you do is carnal. Even your praying could be carnal. Even your devotions could be carnal. Even your Bible reading could be carnal. Even your giving could be carnal. You could do things so spiritual that you're so carnal it's pathetic. That's what's called religion. Not relationship. That's the difference. So what I've put in your hands here is simply this. Father God, I'm trusting in you because you've allowed me to, as you promised on the cross, I will prosper. Uh, Let's just pick another one. How about page 163? Just randomly flying through a couple of these now. Uh, Look at the top one. Okay, topic number 24 is on prayer. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. (laughs) And his ears are open to their... If you're not righteous and in prayer, why are you expecting that God's going to be so busy focusing on you? But I thank you, Father God, that through Jesus Christ on the cross, when he said, it is finished, it is finished that he sees me and he hears me, even in this mess I'm in, and I know he sees me and I know he hears me, so I thank you that you hear my prayers and my righteousness is true, it's yours. Pick another one. Go to a different direction. Let's go to page number 60. Physical health. Life topic number six is all about the condition of your health. We have a lot of people in here struggling with different conditions of your health. You wonder why? Okay, let's just look at the last one simply because it's easier for everybody to see it. Now, let's go to the top one. Okay, here we go. Matthew 6, 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. (laughs) The lamp of the body is the eye. Do you want to know why there's so much darkness going on inside of your your life? Because your light is probably on pretty dark. It's on dimmer, if not on off. Because your eye creates the light that gets in. So what does he say? The lamp of the body is the eye, therefore, if, therefore, if, therefore, which means no partiality, if, therefore, and by the way, any time in the Bible you see the word therefore, God's about to tell you what it's there for. If, therefore, your eye is good. Who doesn't understand the difference between good and evil? You don't need a class on that. You just need to make sure you're in the right class. Be in the good class. Your whole body will be full of light. Wow! What a great conditional promise of God. Father God, I thank you that on the cross, when it is finished, was said that it that was finished is that you made my eye the lamp of my body, and the fact that my whole body can be full of your light will be because, why? My eye looks upon what is good, and I know the difference between what is and what isn't. Every time you look at one single conditional promise, even if you just took one a day and just meditated on that all day with your word, or if you're a regular systematic Bible reader, then all you got to do is go through the, chronolo- the, the chronological side and go, uh, is that going to be in my reading today? 
How do I know there's 1,133 conditional promises of God in the Bible? Because on the very last page it says that there's 1,133. That's the 1,133rd conditional promise of God in the Bible. It's right there. And if you want to know what the 507th conditional promise is, it's right there. So the topics are in the actual order the first time I ever discovered them. It only took 13 and a half years to write this the first time. Do the research. This is like a Strong's Concordance. This is just a research book so you can laser point like Papa just gave me. I can laser point where on me, Lord God, where on me is this thing that isn't lining up with you. And let me get lined up with you, not you get lined up with me. He doesn't have a pointer that runs out of batteries. But you can simply go like this because he gave you free will. Clear? So in everything we have as a blessing, it comes from Jesus Christ. The cross is the means that he used for any blessing we'll ever receive. That's why the cross becomes the object of our faith. There is nothing else that is the object of your faith. And I don't mean the wooden beam. No, 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 no. Everybody be worshiping that. What he accomplished on the cross. The it is finished. It what? What do you need? Because it was finished. And here's 1133 of what they were. I did not include the cursing, punishing, conditional promises, only the blessings ones. Because in the almost 3,700 conditional promises in the Bible, I only pulled out the blessing ones because as children of the light, we should want to walk in the light as he is in the light. And as long as Psalm 109, yeah, Psalm 109, verse 15, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Did I get that right? Psalm 119. Yeah, Psalm 119, 105. Thy word, see what I'm saying? If you don't know your address, how do you expect to find your house? Come on. Learn the doggone addresses so you know how to park your place where you need to lay your rest. Otherwise, the yoke on you is going to bust you hard. And it's going to shred the shoulders you're trying to carry things on. But his burden is easy. His yoke is light. His burden is easy. So you learn the addresses. Now this is not a master combination lock. This is not a genie in the bottle book. Okay, I want one of these. I showed you, you want to live victorious? Then you don't work on the flesh. You don't count on your performance. Because that's failure. But your power source is the Holy Spirit. The object of your faith is the cross. And every single condition of life is in this, from this, connects to this, and that is that. Now, the only reason the other offering books, buckets are up here is for this reason. Normally, every time I've done this all over the country, there's an envelope in your book. And that envelope says that you got this book from somebody who gave you this book, from somebody who gave you this book, from somebody who gave somebody that book, and everybody buys it forward for the next person because I never sell these. Normally, at the end of any time, by now, any leftover book would have already been put back in my car and there's no extras. So if you missed, I told you last week, if you missed, tough luck. That would be normal. And then this is an opportunity time for you to just pray and think and blah, 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 and consider. And then I show you the picture of the motorcycle gang or another church or another church or another church because normally I have you all come together, I take your picture because guess what? The next church I go to, they're going to see your picture because this is your opportunity to give a copy of that book to the next person. I get to give 100. I brought 100 books with me today. I showed you a picture of what I looked like when I first came out with this, pulled my hair out doing it. But the bottom line is this, gang. This is our home. This is my home, Linda's home. 
this is our church home. Papa's our shepherd. You are my family. I love you. I truly love all of you. And every Sunday when you see me dart out in the middle of the service, because I go back to the back of the church and try to spend 10 minutes with the kids and bring them a kid's message. So all I'm going to ask you right now is simply this. If you want to gift forward another book, thank you, but not this time. This time, if you like that book, if you feel it's possible, it was worth it for you, you come and put an additional gift in the buckets whenever you want or before you walk out the door, if you want. And this time, I've given you these books from me and Linda, and all of this gift I want to give back to our family, our church. And that's where this one's going to go. So be extra generous, as I always tell everybody. Somebody can't afford to buy a book, so please buy two for the person who couldn't even buy a book and put 40 bucks in the bucket, or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. And I love you, and I bless God for you. And just remember, it is finished. It what? What do you need? Now he shows us. The it that was finished is the left column. And as a doer of the word, it's the right column. Let me pray for you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, bless my beautiful family. Bless us. Thank you for Papa. Thank you for Mickey. Thank you for Simon. Thank you for Brother Jerry. We have Brother Mike out this month visiting some other churches with Barbara. We thank you for George. We thank you for Elijah. We thank you for... Pastor Simon, we thank you for all those who are ever stepping out from behind the seats to serve for our ushers, our greeters, our bathroom cleaners, for Sally, who's always sacrificing to give the children her time, the work that goes into pouring into the, the church of our future, for the sound we have, the electricity, the bill that gets paid. Father, this time, we want to contribute this gift that was given to us from Freedom Fellowship Church, from men and women whose lives were destroyed at one time through drugs and alcohol and fighting and riotous living of the most amazing, difficult times, who then found you, Jesus Christ, who then came to a place of victory in their life. And by having me there to be their friend and bring this message to them, they gifted forward this very gift that now we've all been able to have. At this time, Father, we want to thank you for our gift by giving it all back to you as an offering. Not our tithe, but our offering gift to help our home, to help our staff, to help our papa, to help everything that we love to come here for every week. And we thank you for it. We also thank you for next week's program that we bless will be coming for the health fitness for the work that Sister Mary's doing for all the families that have brought boxes of the things that they want to be able to give away. We ask that there's an abundance, an overflowing that you promised. Abundance. We thank you for this. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for the health, the healing, the wholeness, the blessing of this week that all of us may prosper in you, Father. Prosper in our faith in you what we have to then bring again to you next week as our offerings. So as the music plays, as they may sing, you could do one of three things. If you got a pick up and book, thank you. If you love your book and you have a gift and you want to say thank you and it goes to our church, bring it up front in the bucket. And if you just want to sit there and glance through it and enjoy what you have as a gift, it is a gift. And I'm just so grateful that I got to spend this part with you.